HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 133, recorded live Tuesday, October 7, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RED Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks machine translation with Helvecio Rivera. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm sitting in Building 99, the fabled Building 99 here at Microsoft Campus in Redmond. This is the home of Microsoft Research. This is an amazing building, and I'll have to point you to pictures online. And I'm sitting here with a test lead for machine translation, uh, Helvecio Ribeiro. Thank Hi you, there, sir. Scott. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk to me. Not a problem. So... I added some translation stuff on my site a while back, and I know that uh, people have seen things like Babelfish for years. But uh, something that you wrote really caught my eye, and I knew I had to come and visit you, and it was T-Bot. Is that what we're calling it? We're calling it T-Bot? Yeah, that's that's the name, T-Bot, our translation bot for Messenger. And so how does T-Bot work? What is the experience like for T-Bot? Um, T-Bot is an endpoint for Messenger that acts like a, a, a human, right? So for all it matters, uh, Messenger thinks that it's routing messages to a human. And what T-Bot does basically is that it sits in the middle of a conversation between two humans that don't speak the same language. Um, so the assumption is that someone wants to talk to someone else that uh, doesn't speak the same um, language, and uh, therefore uh, he or she invites T-Bot to start a conversation, T-Bot will prompt you to select basically what translation you want to perform. And once you're done with the basic selection, you can then invite someone else to join you in a conference. So whatever you s- type is going to be translated from one language to the other. And once your friend on the other end types something else, it's going to reverse the translation. So it pretty much acts like an interpreter in the middle of a conversation. So there's three of us in the conversation. There's me, the other person, and then T-Bot. That's and if, right. If they say hello there, that's right. T-Bot is going to echo what they said. Hola, whatever. Yeah. Let's just imagine that I'm 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 speaking Portuguese, my native language, and mm-hmm. uh, I don't speak English for for whatever reason. So in my case, I would invite T-Bot and say, "Hey, T-Bot, translate everything from Portuguese to English." Okay. And then I would invite you, mm-hmm. right? So anything I type would be translated from Portuguese to English, mm-hmm. would show up in the little conversation. So window. I see your Portuguese. Yes, you do. Okay. Which is also something that helps a lot because machine translation by nature is not perfect. So um, human beings are able to infer when the translation is really bad and and understand the differences. Um, So it's really important to show the original sentence and the uh, translated sentence uh, at the same time. It seems like people give machine translation uh, a hard time. People just laugh and laugh and laugh. I've seen uh, people have... uh, there's There's an old joke from a television show called News Radio. I don't know how long you've been in the States, but this show is called News Radio. Familiar yeah, with it? I, I remember. So are you familiar with Super Karate Monkey Death Car? No. <laughs> so Jimmy James, the owner of the radio station, uh-huh. wrote his biography mm-hmm. and had it translated professionally into Japanese. Uh-huh. And then the Japanese took that translation and had it translated back into English, English. and then sold it. And uh, it got completely twisted around, and one of the chapters became called Super Karate Monkey Death Car. <laughs> and there's no idea where that came from or how it happened, but that's just one of those things that happens, and people really enjoy translating things back and sure. forth. I think that the naysayers might say, you know, why bother? We're just talking pidgin English at, at the end, ultimately, anyway. Yeah, I, it's not that bad. I, I can definitely tell you that, you know, it's it used to be really, really bad. And, and now the new um, uh, research on statistical translation um, definitely have improved the quality of, of, of what you get. Mm-hmm. Now, there are a couple of different things that you have to consider when taking, you know, when, when talking about either a chat or I am conversation. Um, first of all, there's always retries. So people can actually try again if the uh, translated sentence makes no sense. Um, 
And another thing that you have to keep in mind is that once you have access to both the original and the translated, most of the times you can infer what the person was trying to say. Of course, in my case, I speak no Japanese. So looking at the original sentence in Japanese would, would make me no good at all. But at the same time, there is a possibility that I can ask again, I didn't understand, could you please repeat? And, and not just repeat, but rephrase. Exactly. And people do that. So one of the things that I learned in the very beginning of, of the project, while it was still a prototype, was that people change the way they type in order to get better translations. Yeah, that's funny. I thought that I was kind of the only one that did that because I, yep. I speak a couple of languages and I know, I, I feel like I'm gaming the system. Exactly. You know, I'm that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So um, you start using less slangs. Um, you try to form sentences differently in order to get the best translation because your goal is actually to communicate. Right. It's not, you know, to get perfect translation. It, it's to send your message across. So you end up adapting to whatever restriction you have. So that's specific to um, either multi-language chat rooms or, or IM conversations, right? Now, with respect to documents, well, um, again, I think that the Microsoft technology is such that, uh, um, yeah, it's not perfect. Um, and most definitely, we need to improve a lot in several different um, aspects. But the fact that we have something called the bilingual viewer for document translation is really, really effective. So the bilingual viewer interface is something that presents you with basically two frames, right? One with the source document, mm -hmm. the other one with the target document in translated in whatever language you select, and allows you to A, select sentences in both frames at the same time. So there's highlighting mm. that allows you to actually position the cursor and, and read source and, and, and target. And you have uh, synchronized scrolling. So you always have the original page for your reference and the translated page for reading, for example. And that seems like that would make sense for people who speak a little bit of either language. I mean, everyone speaks a little bit of English. Right. And, and everyone speaks a little bit of Spanish. I don't know. That, that's true, but also helps with um, a couple of very common mistakes that most of the machine translation systems make, mm -hmm. like translating addresses, for example. Ah. That can throw you completely. It'll build a whole sentence yes. around an address. Right. Um, or, you know, whenever it gets the, a name wrong, it tries to translate the, someone name, for mm -hmm. example. So those mistakes are very common, and it's not just particular to um, our system. Uh, most of, you know, the, the translation systems around, they are based on the same, you know, principle. So they do try to uh, sometimes translate stuff that by, by default should not be translated. So in those cases, having access to the source and the target frames is, like, essential to figure out that you should not bother basically with bad translations. Now, you mentioned the, the innovations in, if I understand correctly, statistical? Yes. Translation. What, can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, just a little bit because it's not my area of expertise. But mm -hmm. basically, you can think about um, this new generation of systems as um, um, something that consumes a bunch of text, right, written in, in more than one language. We call those parallel texts. Um, so basically, you have a document in English and a document with the equivalent translation in Portuguese. You feed the system with several millions of sentences like that, parallel data, right? And the system learns uh -huh. how to translate from one language to the other. So the quality of your result um, directly depends on the amount of parallel data you submit to the system. Now, if you go back in time, like I, I would say five years ago, um, the uh, systems were a little different. You would actually try to build a grammar describing how, you know, the I language was put. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> how the language so was put that together. Up. Yes, we did, and and now we are trying to teach the systems how to actually um, learn by themselves. So I think that you know it it will drastically improve the overall quality of 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 the results as we move forward. Interesting. It seems like the data that humans create is not pretty. And nope. when someone tries to create a grammar or an equation or some kind of thing, ultimately it comes down to, uh, well, you know, it's like CAPTCHA, right? Exactly. This is the equivalent, you know. Right. Two humans did a lot of work and we'll let the computer figure it out, warts, warts and all, as mm -hmm. we say, right? Mm -hmm. 
which would be something I would never feed into a translator. There you go. Because it wouldn't yes. understand what words yes. and all meant. But that's that's a, actually another um, good point because, I mean, um, one of the problems that we um, are, well, at least trying to solve, not with the current generation of system, but, but thinking ahead, is um, the fact that contextual translation is heavily based on, well, your context. Right. So if by any chance you're um, translating a document that has a bunch of insurance, you know, lingo on it, well, guess what? If you apply the wrong um, contextual information, you're going to get a bunch of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same time, um, it's com it's vaguely possible that we are going to be able to build a, a system so flexible that we'll understand every single possible context. So there are thoughts around having specialized versions of translation engines, right? And it's not a secret. Everyone in the industry thinks about it, and, and we haven't figured out the best way to implement it yet. But, you know, right. that's that's another example. That's just the nature of language. I uh, I have bad um, bad hands, so I don't do a lot of typing. So I use uh, naturally speaking or Vista right. voice command. And I know that, like, on the Dragon naturally speaking side, they have the medical dictionary and the legal dictionary. So that's their right. way of context yes. is you tell me the words that you're likely to so over yeah. the years, I've had to build my own dictionary with words like XML serializer. There you go. That uh, you know, the, the the Scott Hanselman specific grammar. Right. That's that's a very similar you know um, um, problem that we are trying to solve. Um, up to a couple months ago, we used to have a little checkbox on, on our landing page um, that would allow people to actually decide whether the content that they are trying to translate is computer related or not. <laughs> right? Because if we could apply our own, you know, specific rules for computer related, you know, content, mm -hmm. we would provide better translations. But it, that was proved to be too complicated and, and the average user would not understand what this little checkbox was all about. Yeah. So we are now, you know, back to a generic domain, you know, solution where we are pretty much applying um, um, the same rules across the board for any document that you send for translation. Do you know how to make the possible out of the impossible? Well, the .NET ninjas at Teleric do. They just released a huge pack of web controls all built on top of ASP.NET AJAX that'll help you build impossibly fast and interactive applications in no time at all. They've made the impossible possible in desktop development. If you think you can't have a carousel component in WinForms, well, you can. Their Windows Form Suite features a super powerful grid view control and 32 other crazy desktop components that'll give you dazzling WPF-like features, but in WinForms. They do the same thing in reporting solutions with a new design surface like nothing else. Looks just like graph paper. Gives you advanced page layout capabilities. Makes it feel more like a graphic design software than a reporting solution. Go check them out at Teleric.com and be a .NET Ninja. And thanks for listening. Now, you're the test lead for machine translation, but you wrote this this bot, this agent. That's right, and, yes. And did you write this from scratch, or is there an SDK that... Uh, can I write one of these agents? Uh, yes, you can. But in terms of what I did, um, one year ago when I started thinking about the bot, um, I did not have access to the SDK. Um, I didn't actually know <laughs> that Microsoft has an SDK for um, writing bots called Live Agents. Right. So what I did basically was to look around for C sharp based, you know, um, um, interfaces. And I, I wrote my little prototype that ran for about one year, um, based on very low level, um, protocol handshaking routines in C sharp. So you just wrote a service that just talked on one an port, endpoint. Talk, an endpoint. Yes. Basically, like I said, the bot pretends to be a human, mm -hmm. right, for Messenger. So it was a little program that ran on my server at home mm -hmm. um, that would log into the Messenger server, right, and uh, would just sit down pretty, right? So whenever people invited for a conversation, would reply, ask for um, the languages, and would start providing translations in the middle. Mm -hmm. But, you know, once the, the prototype proved to be something useful, um, uh, it became clear that there was an opportunity to build a uh, real product. But you did this on your own. Did the bosses immediately see that this was a good idea? Uh, no. <laughs> so. It took a while. Um, but finally, uh, this last September, September, I mean, no, we're talking February. February 2008, um, I was invited to show it on um, the Research Tech Fest. And then it got the momentum and people start, you know, thinking about putting a product that actually 
you know, um, th does the same. And this product then is based on a very reliable infrastructure, like I said, called um, Live Agents. Um, there's a whole group supporting the framework. Um, this product is written in, in the Live Agents scripting language. It's called BuddyScript. Oh, really? So this isn't like a file new Windows service and then write the whole thing in C-sharp? Nope, like nope. The first they, they do it all for you. I mean, they mm -hmm. have, yeah, they have a runtime. Basically, what you have to do is, you know, use um, um, their own scripting language. The runtime will then, on the fly, interpret this language and start executing the steps. So it's pretty cool, and uh, they have a website that describes, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, how to interact with uh, the SDK. It's called dev.live.com slash agents. Okay. Um, and there's a bunch of documentation on how to actually write your own bot. So where does it live? It lived at your house before. Where is the agent now? Well, in some data center supported by the live agents team. Uh, and it's did, a real thing now. Now, if I was going to write an agent, let's say, for example, I get a lot of people chatting me and asking for help. Right. If I was going to make fake Scott Hanselman, right, that would just maybe send them random links or tell them to go search Google or uh -huh. leave me alone. I don't want to help you. Right. How do I how do I do this? I, I I believe that the right way to do it would be to install the SDK following the guidelines that they propose in in the documentation. Right. Um, you can play around with it. There is a little prototype module that you can um, play around with, like using localhost. Oh, okay. Um and once you have your final version, then you submit this to oh. um their group and if they they want to publish and, and you know there's a whole um a discussion on how to do it, okay. they will get in touch and uh go. And then from this there. will be hosted in the cloud by them. Yes. So if I were an ISV that wanted to provide support or access to um travel information or, or whatever. I remember right. years and years ago there was an, an a bot, the very first bot that I ever saw mm -hmm. it was called Smarter Child. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, th I think it was AOL, and now it's on Live Messenger that's also. Right, right. You, you, you probably have heard about Wilma. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly the same team that uh, uh, built Wilma. Oh wow! So it's okay, pretty cool. Yeah, this stuff's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you go about testing something like machine translation? I mean, I this, you obviously speak more than one language. Does does uh, that help? Well, it it helps understand how. Better of a job we do sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I speak Portuguese and a little Spanish and, uh, I try to speak English most of the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can spot, you know, um, um, bad translations now and then. Now, the statistical system is kind of tricky because actually what you detect is something that happened way before. So you fed the system once upon a time and you generated a model, you deploy this model to a test environment and you start testing this model, oh. right? So once you detect a bad translation or something that is really, really awkward, mm -hmm. it probably means that, that the training process injected something bad. It doesn't mean that the model itself is perfect, but mainly that the training data that you fed to the system contains something awkward, right? So there are basically two different angles f for testing a system like that. There is, of course, the basics. You know, it's a service. It has to scale. It has to be reliable. It has to be accessible. But there's also the little angle of language translation quality, which is really, really complicated, even though there are some um, standard indicators like the blue scores, which is a complicated formula for how to send um you know sentences through the system and try to identify how close or oh, really? far so you, so you it is score from the them. System. You actually yes. score them. Yes. It's part of the nightly build um to generate the blue scores and make sure that we are not completely off mm -hmm. in, in one language. Basically you have you know what to expect from certain languages and you um I mean from certain sentences and you try to identify how close or or mm -hmm. or not close you are from from the target um, and are the, sti the the statistical models are on a per language pair so there's right. kind of a, a cross product of yep. pairs yep so you would want to find uh you know maybe uh a, a copy of Anne Boleyn written in English and French but also mm -hmm. written in French and Portuguese yes and yes. you would have to compare you'd need Actually, six translations to get that working. English, French, French, Portuguese, Portuguese. Now English. you get how complicated it can get, ah. right? So the availability of parallel data is critical for the system. Okay. And that's definitely one of, of, of the bottlenecks we have right now. Um, 
the the back end and the system architecture itself is quite flexible i'm not going to say that you know um, be naive and say that once you have the data you get the model the next day sure. but definitely having good quantity of parallel sentences is um, one of the biggest bottlenecks that we have nowadays. Now, as, as test lead, is that something that's your responsibility to go looking for, or who is out there looking for the corpus? Oh, there's a bunch of people um, looking looking for the right data and also making sure that we have the right to actually um, um, fetch and use the data, right? Because mm-hmm. there are two different things. I mean, once well, the data is available, you have to make sure that you can use this data, right? right? Otherwise, you know, weird things can happen. It would seem to me, and I'm just totally, I mean, I'm not familiar with this field, so I'm brainstorming here, but it seems to me like the Bible would probably be a good place to start in the sense of it's been translated typically in any, in any new language that mm-hmm. it's like quote unquote discovered. Whenever the Western, whenever Western civilization shows up, the first thing they do is they try to convert the natives. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they'll write the Bible in that language. So that typically represents the, the first biggest chunk of text in a particular language. What, what are you using religious texts? I, I honestly, I don't know. Hmm. I know that we have several different segments of data, um, and uh, there is a fair amount of um, educational data, but uh, I wouldn't know about religion at mm-hmm. this point in time. I, well, I know you don't. I'm not asking about religion specifically. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that uh, there's a lot of Bibles that are sure, in the uh, sure. in the absolutely in the public domain. Yeah, um, I'm, I just. Don't know, honestly. Now, do you get into kind of a, a, a butterfly effect? Like you were talking about how far back, you know, a butterfly flaps its wings in, right. in, in uh, right. Florida and suddenly there's a hurricane in Rio. Do you have situations where you just can't root cause something? Or if oh, you absolutely. go back and you try to fix it, it'll ruin everything else? Yeah. So yeah, it's going to have to be wrong? Yes. Um, so that's, that's one of the trickiest part of this whole thing, right? Because, I mean, given that it's statistical, I mean, how many um, sources of the same bad translation have you had the chance to feed the system ah. to get this bad result going through mm-hmm. so a good example to that would be um let's just assume that in the future we have this collaboration system right that allows you and i to submit corrections to um the documents we we um we uh we think are not properly translated mm-hmm. right so um, I see a bad Portuguese translation, a right click on a sentence, and I go like, no, this should be the right translation. Okay. Well, that's great, right? But how can the system trust me? Yeah, right? I mean, there's no reputation built there's in. There's absolutely right? no reputation built in. So, um, and it's really easy. I mean, you can say, oh, yeah, if you just get one feedback about this translation, probably it's bad. Mm-hmm. But you can totally think about political or even other intentions, right? That would have a group of people translating or or um, correcting a sentence well, now on I'm, purpose. Now I'm realizing right? that my question about religious texts was probably a stupid one, because if ever there were something that could be argued, well, yeah, it would be religious translation. It's, it's it's one of those things, right? I mean, you have to be careful because you have to build first a very reliable reputation system mm-hmm. to be able to allow those things to to um, um, affect the quality of your translation. So, does the public stuff now allow you to vote and have you know, I don't think this is right. Right. Yes, it does. And you do take that um, crowdsourcing. That's data right. Right. As yes, yeah, it's it's a good indication that something is really bad. But we haven't developed the uh, reputation system yet to um, um, allow people to actually enter their corrections. Hmm. Um, it's something that uh, you know it's it's probably going to come in the near future. But uh, um, it's it's an interesting challenge. Let's put it this way: it's not a technical challenge, in my opinion. Um, is more like okay, a social and and uh, experimental um, um, challenge because uh, you have to trust humans one way or the other. And right. how how do you do that? Well, this that 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 word I love that word crowdsourcing <laughs> and rather than outsourcing. We're crowdsourcing. Recently, uh, I was on Facebook and I noticed that Facebook is um, trying to translate their site into every language in the universe, just right. like just like Google did. Uh-huh. And uh, they're doing it on a reputation system. So mm-hmm. I went in and I said, well, I want to see. Uh, Facebook in, in Zulu, right? My wife's uh, language. So uh, I started translating and picking different words, and you know I know some Zulu, so I started translating Facebook into Zulu, trying to figure out what the right Zulu word for back button was, and all sorts of stuff. That's cool. And then notice that that uh, people vote up or down. Uh, but then, of course, do we trust those votes? Are those exactly. real people? You exactly. Know, you have to follow that all the way mm-hmm. back. 
Yeah. And that could have huge statistical uh, ramifications downstream. Absolutely. And it's much easier for um, um, someone like me or you to put together something like that and go like, hey, help me translate that. Actually, I, I went through a similar process when I uh, first wrote my little prototype because um, the whole dialogue in between the bot and the human that invoked the translation was based on some sentences, right? So you I just would talk have to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you would have to translate those sentences to be able to, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> start a conversation with someone in Japan, right? right. So I had to go and uh, crowdsource yeah. my uh, first translations. And and uh, interesting enough, some some people actually volunteered through my little blog, right? Yeah. I asked for help, and people volunteered that their time and 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 enter some translations. I I tried to double check if. Um, Something was really bad, but you know, mm-hmm. it, it worked. But I'm quite sure that it's one thing to, you know, have a small little pet project mm-hmm. um, taking this route, and it's completely different when you think about a uh, a product from a big company like Microsoft or Google or Apple. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot that that may influence um, that. You know, it's not necessarily technical. Now, right now, Messenger doesn't know about this because it's just a fake person out there with, mm-hmm. uh, I, I presume, unlimited friends. Right. He the live that. agents framework takes care of that. Okay. Yes. Would you like to see this kind of pushed into uh, Messenger itself? Or is that is that a goal to maybe build this into live Messenger so I could click a button and it would be a different UI? Uh, I would love it. I mean, we should uh, talk. We should go talk to those guys. That would be cool. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm one of those guys that think that you know, machine translation is a cool feature to have in any product whatsoever. Yeah. Right. So, um, I I'm a firm believer again that that broken translation is way better than no translation whatsoever. Right. So, um, and my example is always the same. I mean, I, if I go to Japan and I'm lost and I only have my cell phone, guess what? I'm going to use Tbot. To ask for help, right? Really? Have you ever found yourself in that situation yet? Not yet. Are you just waiting? Because <laughs> I never went should, to Japan. You should go somewhere and just <laughs> force that to happen. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? The, my Spanish is not so good, and sometimes I, I, I joke around with, with you know, um, translations to Spanish, and it does pretty well. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> there's, I a, some... uh, there's a comedian named uh, Eddie Izzard who uh, said that he doesn't speak he, – he, he speaks French, but the joke was that in, he's – he learned French, but he only learned a few phrases, you know, and like one of them was like the cat is under the table right. and the monkey is in the branch. Right. So you know, he's like, you know, he learns la songe signe la branche, but he has nowhere to use that. Right. So he goes out into the woods and he rents a monkey and he puts it <laughs> into the, just waiting for anyone who speaks French to walk by so that he could find the opportunity there you go. to use this. So I feel like I'm going to go and just hunt for people who don't speak English so that I might be able to talk to them. Yeah, absolutely. And this whole mo- mobile solution thing is is another, you know, um, um, I think good example of how the technology is has a potential to grow. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not specifically talking about Tbot, mm-hmm. but more like portable translators, right? Yeah. You know, um, the possibility of translating a sentence and maybe adding TTS text to speech to it. Right. Right. So the prototype had text to speech. Um, and when we release the product, we, we choose not to implement it yet, mm. simply because of some complexities that, that, that have to do with how do you actually generate the audio files. Mm-hmm. But, uh, that's, you know, one of those things that you go like, well, yeah, if I have a little mobile thing and I can right. press a button and, and it, it speaks something that I, you know, I need. Yeah. Um, I'll try it. It doesn't really matter if it's perfect or not perfect. I'm, I'm quite sure I will get what I want. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the only thing that's keeping us from that is 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 really ubiquitous wireless. Mm-hmm. You know, or do you have connectivity when you need exactly when you need connectivity? Exactly. Interesting. Well, thank you very much, Alvesio Ribeiro, with test lead for machine translation, and uh, people can check this out at mtbot at hotmail dot com. They can add that to their live messenger, and then uh, is it translator dot live dot com? They can see this. That's right. That's our landing page for our product. There's a bunch of information about what we do, and uh, of course, there's a couple of interfaces to very interesting translation systems that we we offer. Well, there's also a, a JavaScript that you can add to your blog and have a little combo box that will automatically translate your website yep. back and forth. You, you can have it all at uh, translator.live.com. All right. And that's the, you know, our, our front end to uh, what we have been offering so far. And uh, you should check it out because pretty soon you're, we are going to see some very interesting offerings. How are you going to know when you're done? Uh, we are not going to be done. You'll never be done? No. Fantastic. 
All right, well, this has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'll see you again next week.